This is David Dunning. You probably don't recognize his face. You probably don't recognize, I don't know, the shirt he's wearing or anything like that. But um, he's famous. His name became famous. The Dunning-Kruger effect has been a joke on every TV talk show, every sitcom. It's become a staple of, I don't know, boardroom humor. And it's definitely become a major area of scientific research in psychology, the social sciences, um, so-called behavioralism, study of human behavior. And, you know, why? Did he discover something? Did he make some kind of scientific breakthrough? Did he make a light bulb that's 10% brighter or lasts 10% longer or something? No, 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 no. He told the crowd a story. He told people a story that they really wanted to hear. It just amused people. The same way a meme becomes famous on the internet, this idea of the Dunning-Kruger effect just became a worldwide phenomenon. That's not evil. And it doesn't mean that David Dunning here is a fraud or even that he's intentionally trying to mislead you. But right now, in the year 2019, all around the world, people, starting with peer-reviewed academic journals, people, people like you and me on YouTube, people are having to deal with the revelation that the whole Dunning-Kruger effect is fake. It's not based on valid empirical data or research. And the question is now, can we let go of, can we show appropriate detachment about this story that became so much more popular than the scientific facts it was supposed to describe. So in this video, you're going to hear again and again that the famous Dunning-Kruger effect is fake. That it's not real and it never was real. That it's an idea that people found appealing in the same way that they might find an urban legend or a modern myth appealing. The problem is, this type of misperception becomes dangerous precisely because people think it is science. Now, this isn't a digression at all. I wish it was. What you're looking at here is Sir Isaac Newton. You probably associate the name Newton with the word scientist, gravity, and maybe a charming anecdote about an apple falling from an apple tree. That's the story we tell ourselves. What if I told you that he was a politician? What if I told you that he was actually elected to Parliament after running for office? Twice. What if I told you that he was a special agent for the government? What if I told you he investigated and prosecuted people for, for counterfeiting? What if I told you that he wasn't merely religious, but was actually a religious maniac who spent a large part of his adult life creating and propounding insane reinterpretations of biblical passages, a side of his life that today nobody seems to be comfortable talking about? Wow, you might think. The image of this guy as a secular scientist is really a gross simplification, a gross misrepresentation of a very eccentric character, somebody who had a diverse and rich life experience. Isn't it a shame that we can't be honest about all the contradictions that are bundled up in the real history of this character, and maybe some of the contradictions that are bundled up with mm, the production of new scientific knowledge, new cultural ideas, instead of telling ourselves these convenient little stories that really conceal more than they reveal. Here's the thing, guys. It's not that easy. Just think about the period of time this guy lived through. Look at his date of birth and his date of death. We're not just trying to distract ourselves from the fact that this guy was a religious maniac who worked in law enforcement for the National Mint. Have you ever once, even once in your life, heard anyone quote or comment on Isaac Newton's views on slavery? Think about when he was born, think about when he died, and guess what we're really covering up here? We're creating the idea of Sir Isaac Newton as a secular, humanist, progressive super genius, but we're covering up genocide, colonialism, and slavery in the most mind-blowing period of the atrocities of the British Empire. You've got to force yourself to ignore more than 90% of his extant writing and more than 90% of what he really cared about, what he did with his own time during his own life, to believe this, I don't know, fable of who Sir Isaac Newton was or what he's supposed to represent for us today. Isaac Newton really cared about politics. Maybe we should too. This is part of the problem 
in thinking clearly about science, history, and politics, especially when all three are overlapping in the world's sexiest Venn diagram. Take this dubious illustration of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Professional bikini model Caroline Zalig. What is up you guys? Welcome back to another video. Uh, right before I started filming this, I checked my grade on an assignment I just did. Um, and I, I thought I did really well when I was turning it in. I was actually pretty excited because I thought I was going to get a good grade. It turns out the teacher didn't think so because he gave me a 30%. Yeah, that happened. If we stop playing the tape here, it seems like a perfect example of Dunning-Kruger. The title of the original hypothesis, let's not forget, is, quote, unskilled and unaware of it. But let's listen to her perspective for just one more moment. Um, and I, I thought I did really well when I was turning it in. I was actually pretty excited because I thought I was going to get a good grade. It turns out the teacher didn't think so because he gave me a 30%. Yeah, that happened. I realized school's not my thing. Um, I do what I can. I try my best, but then I proceeded to spill water on my laptop. So... If we just pause and think about this juxtaposition for half a second, it illustrates how implausible the Dunning-Kruger hypothesis really is. Now keep in mind, the word implausible doesn't mean false. It just means that they would really need evidence, compelling evidence, to prove their case. And as you probably already know, because you're watching this video, the math actually doesn't add up. There were three really obvious possibilities here. The first possibility is that the story she's telling is funny precisely because it's rare or extraordinary. It isn't every day that driving instructors have a student proclaim that they're really great at driving a car and then, minutes later, utterly fail the test. If you know someone who works as a driving instructor, they maybe have a few funny stories like that from over the years, but the stories are funny because they're unusual. If it happened every day, if it were 70% of people doing this, it really wouldn't be funny anymore. It would just be part of human nature we'd all be accustomed to, right? If that was just the normal way most people think and act, oblivious to their own incompetence all the time, there'd really be nothing funny about it. For every one story you hear about an incompetent driver like this, who, who, who's too confident in their own ability and then fails, how many stories, by contrast, do you hear about people who voluntarily refuse to drive at night? You know, people who just tell you, oh, no, no, my eyesight isn't good enough. I'm not a good enough driver. I don't drive at night. I only drive during the day. How many people tell you that they would never drive in the snow or that they avoid driving on certain highways because they know, they know they're not that good at driving. They're aware of their own limited competence. Okay? That's what these peer-reviewed papers call metacognition. And it's not really very rare at all. The second possibility with this story is that this woman is just genuinely aware that she's not a very good student, as she says herself. But she's choosing to present this story in a funny way. If you just reverse the order of the two parts of the story she's told you, suddenly there's nothing amusing about it. She's a bikini model who knows that she's a poor student. She struggles to get a passing grade and then fails. That's really sad. Through a sort of uh, inversion of our expectations, an unexpected juxtaposition, it becomes a cute anecdote. If that kind of overconfidence were the default human condition, it wouldn't seem funny or quirky or amusing. If I tell you that when I feel hungry, I eat a piece of bread, that's not amusing. If I tell you that whenever I'm hungry, I angrily shake my fist at a loaf of bread and I curse the gods for this affliction, that's well, sort of quirky and bizarre. Some people might find that funny. Because the point is here, you don't normally blame the loaf of bread for your hunger. That's an inversion of our expectations, right? The third possibility with this scenario, the most implausible and difficult to prove of all, is that this woman is actually incapable of metacognition. All right? Metacognition is this fancy scientific-sounding word for being aware of one's own thinking. This is what the Dunning-Kruger hypothesis is inviting you to believe. It's inviting you to believe that this anecdote isn't a joke, but is an accurate description of the way a huge percentage of people behave a huge percentage of the time. To really believe in the Dunning-Kruger effect, you would have to believe that this woman is lying to you when she says, 
I realize school is not my thing. That she's incapable of realizing it. That she can't be aware of her own incompetence because the research says so. That sounds absurd, right? Read it from the original thesis. Quote, their incompetence robs them of the metacognitive ability to realize it. Close quote. The burden of proof to support that claim would be huge. If you think any significant percentage of incompetent people cannot recognize their own incompetence, you should be able to prove that empirically, right? This is, this is science, not just religion. I realize school's not my thing. Um, I do what I can. I try my best, but... Do we really live in a world where the vast majority of incompetent drivers think they're great at driving, and the vast majority of professional bikini models are sincerely expecting an A+, when they receive a failing grade. The claim isn't just that this happens once in a while. The claim of the Dunning-Kruger hypothesis is that your incompetence robs you of the ability to even be aware of your own incompetence. It isn't just that you might be guilty of wishful thinking once in a while. Oh, no, 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 no. The Dunning-Kruger theory is that you actually cannot assess yourself. Now, why do I use vague phrases in summarizing Dunning-Kruger? Why do I say a huge percentage of the population have this problem instead of giving a specific number? Why am I so vague? Because the charts that they choose to show, Dunning-Kruger, the other social sciences who jumped on the bandwagon, the, the charts that they choose to show are vague. Look at this chart presented by Dunning himself. This makes it appear that the vast majority of people think they're way more competent than they actually are. Where the blue line and the red line intersect, way over on the, the right-hand side there, those are the people who accurately evaluated their own ability. And then beyond that, on the far right end of the chart, those are the people who were more competent than they thought they were. But this makes it look like the vast majority of humanity is to the left of that intersection, right? <laughs> This chart intentionally does not tell us what percentage of people have significantly overestimated their competence. Instead, it creates the illusion that the vast majority of people really thought of themselves as much, much more competent than they were, at least in this particular test. The Dunning-Kruger theory has created a cottage industry in this type of pseudoscientific presentation that audiences embrace without questioning the empirical basis, simply because they find it amusing, uplifting, entertaining, maybe even a little flattering to their own egos. The theory invites us to imagine ourselves as part of a small elite that can laugh at the vast majority of the population who are seemingly like cartoon villains, believing in their own crazy schemes until the hero shows how they can all go disastrously wrong. So this is where we begin our own little fable of scientific discovery. A lowly professor of geology started evaluating his students' performance in 1992. This involves surveys that ask some of the same types of questions that the Dunning-Kruger effect is interested in, asking students how much they know or how much they think they know, and then comparing that to how well they could perform on exams, their final grade in the course, so on and so forth. Ultimately, the purpose of this research was to try to help students to learn effectively, to help professors teach effectively, so on and so forth. It wasn't about performing a script in front of an audience at a TED Talk. It wasn't about trying to start a meme trying to get famous or, I don't know, to produce content for sitcoms. In its way, this really is a significant part of the story. It's also interesting that Ed Neufer was not trying to challenge the Dunning-Kruger model. As late as 2011, he was taking his own data and trying to create the same types of charts showing the same types of effects that were then very fashionable throughout, I don't know, psychology, behavioral science, and to some extent within educational evaluation as a special discipline. It was then that he had his eureka moment. It seemed that any data he put through the same process of analysis and displayed with the same types of graphs would show the same so-called Dunning-Kruger effect. He could use random numbers and get similar outcomes. Using real data that he knew to be good and using fake data that he knew to be bad produced similar looking results. To some extent, he knew that the method of displaying the Dunning-Kruger effect in charts was either massively exaggerating the effect or conjuring it up like a mirage. Of course, the other problem 
was that when you just displayed the real data in other types of graphs, the mirage seemed to disappear. Take a look real briefly here. I have an earlier video on the topic, but yeah. We're talking about 20 years of psychological research and behavioral science based on a mirage, based on something that is not real, on a kind of made up or misrepresented data that even a geologist could refute. Admittedly, that geologist then spent years working with mathematicians to pin down the details and to get it all through peer review and published. But the fundamental problem did not require an expert to detect, neither an expert in psychology, nor an expert in human behavior, nor even an expert in math. And guess what? I already have a video explaining that. I already have a video that talks you through step by step what you're going to find in the first two major peer-reviewed papers that break this story wide open, prove it to you, show you the evidence step by step. Guess what? Right now, 2019 is the year when people finally start to figure it out. This has been proven. This is not a matter of opinion. Ultimately, this comes down to hard numbers that nobody can just dismiss or balk at. There are at least two more major peer-reviewed papers coming out this year, 2019, dealing with the fact that the Dunning-Kruger effect is not real. The depressing question I have to ask you, and that we all have to ask ourselves is, who is going to care? Are people really going to be open to dealing with this reality, learning the lessons about the condition shaping the production of knowledge in the 21st century? Are we even going to take this as some kind of grave warning about how the peer review process itself works? Or do people just want to construct another fable that makes them feel good about themselves? Like the fable of Isaac Newton sitting under an apple tree. Fable that's not completely false, but that really conceals much more than it reveals. Thanks for your time. Support this channel on Patreon, or don't. The facts don't lie. But trust me, a lot of people are making money by lying about the facts.